I'm Andy from Adoptronic and this video explains how to do the idle setup in the ECU settings. So I've done another video already explaining how to wire up the idle control valve and how to configure the auxiliary outputs. If, that's, if you haven't already done that then you should go back and watch that video. As I said in the other video, um, idle control is one of the trickiest things to set up right but it makes such a big difference to drivability when it is right so it's, it's worth doing. First we need to understand the, what the engine actually needs before I go on to describe how to set it up in the ECU. So the engine that needs the least amount of idle air is the one that's at operating temperature and doesn't have any additional loads placed on the engine. When the engine's cold it needs more air to idle at the same RPM. I'm not exactly sure why, I think it might be because either the oil is more viscous at the lower RPM or that due to thermal expansion the engine's a bit tighter when it's cold but for whatever reason when the engine's cold it needs more air to idle at the same RPM. Now normally though you'd actually want the engine to idle higher at low RPM. Manufacturers do this all the time, I'm not 100% sure why. I think it might be that at lower RPM you've got a greater chance of fuel condensing on runner walls and cylinder walls which may, leads to higher um, hydrocarbon emissions. At the higher RPM there's less possibility of that happening and also the engine runs smoother. Mechanical loads on the engine such as power steering pumps, air conditioners and anything that loads down the alternator also cause the RPM to drop. So you need to compensate for those as well to bring up the idle air to compensate for the extra load placed on the engine. Now, occasionally people have asked us why do we actually need the idle control valve at all? Can't we just do it by changing the fuel going into the engine? Well the short answer is no because the engine torque is controlled by how big the fire is inside the engine basically. A petrol engine will really only run over a fairly narrow range of air fuel ratios and will certainly only get good emissions um, response over that range. So controlling the torque just by changing the fuel as you can do in a diesel engine isn't really an option. Um, if you don't believe the technical explanation think of it from an economic point of view. The OEMs don't waste money, they don't go put, putting these valves on engines you know, if they didn't need to. If you think you can do it without using a valve then good luck to you and I think that you should tell the OEMs how they're doing it all wrong and how they could save millions of dollars a year. In my other video on different idle actuators I've covered how to wire them and so in this video I'm going to talk about how to actually change the settings in the ECU to make them work correctly. The ECU calculates a number which we generically call idle effort. So this could be the number of steps on an idle stepper motor or it could be the duty cycle on a pulse width modulated valve. So on the stepper motor it ranges between 0 and the number of steps of the motor and on the PWM valve it ranges from 0 to 100%. Higher numbers mean more air going into the engine. The ECU allows you to specify maximum and minimum idle efforts and the ECU will always keep the idle effort between these two numbers. So in normal operation the maximum should be 100 for a PWM valve and it should be the number of steps for a stepper motor. But what this also means is that if you want to apply a fixed duty cycle or send the motor to a certain number of steps you can set the minimum and the maximum to the same number and then that's what the ECU will output. This can be useful for initially testing the idle valve and making sure that it's wired and plumbed up correctly. At any time you can see the idle effort in the gauge window and it also appears in the log file. Next I'm going to explain how the ECU calculates the idle effort. It's similar to the way the, the ECU calculates fuel or ignition timing in that you have a base map and you have a bunch of feed forward compensations for different conditions and then in closed loop mode you have feedback as well based on the target value. So let's look at the open loop corrections first of all. Now firstly because the idle effort depends so much on the engine temperature we have a base idle effort table which is a function of temperature. You can edit it here. So just like with a fuel map you want to set this table so that it gives you the correct value without any compensations assume that you don't need any compensations. So really we want the value in this table to match the idle effort that we need to get the engine to idle at the target temperature. On an engine with a wax pellet generally this table is pretty flat against temperature but on an engine without a wax pellet, for example a stepper motor type system, generally you need a lot more air at the lower temperatures. The easiest way to do this is to start the engine from cold and then manually adjust the values as the engine warms up. And then once it's got to operating temperature you can extrapolate the high temperature and low temperature sections. Secondly, there's an air temperature correction table. I've never used this personally, it was only put in because some people have requested it. So generally I'd say to leave this table at zero. The next thing I'm going to talk about is how to set up compensations for different loads on the engine. 
Generally you'd start off with the largest load first of all, which is normally the air conditioner. I'm not going to go through all the ins and outs of how to set up air conditioning control in the ECU. It's explained in the manual and I'll probably do another video on that at some point later on. But once it's set up, when the air conditioner input is activated, the ECU first adds on the additional idle effort for the air conditioner and then a bit under a second afterwards it switches on the compressor output. So this enables the engine RPM to increase before the load's applied. And this helps compared to if you do them at the same time where the engine sort of stumbles a bit when you first turn on the air conditioner. So you need to adjust this additional effort for air conditioner value so that it's the eventual idle effort with the air conditioner on minus the idle effort with the air conditioner off at operating temperature. If this number is too small then the engine will stumble when you first turn on the air conditioner or perhaps even stall and if you have the number too large then the engine will stumble when you turn it off because the ECU will take out that amount of effort when you turn the air conditioner off. You can also set additional electrical load inputs which will increase the base idle effort and also increase the target idle RPM. A really common example of this is a power steering load input. So normally on the power steering pump there's a pressure switch which pulls to ground when the pressure exceeds a certain value. So all you need to do is connect this into a digital input on the ECU, set up that digital input to be electrical load 1 for argument's sake, and then adjust the extra effort for electrical load 1 so that when you apply the steering load to the engine the idle speed is stable. You can also verify when the electrical load is being triggered by looking at the F11 window to make sure first of all that the digital input is pulling to ground and also that the electrical load is being activated. You can also do the same with headlights, blower fan and other electrical loads. Normally headlights need to be active high rather than active low, but it's easy to check once you've got it wired up and you can look at it in the F11 window. There's one more open loop control issue that we need to talk about and that's post crank idle up. Most engines seem to want to idle up a bit higher just after they start and the way that's done is by adjusting these settings. It tapers off over time so if you say the extra effort is 10% for 10 seconds, then immediately after starting you get 10% additional idle effort. At 5 seconds afterwards you get 5% extra idle effort and then it tapers off to zero additional effort at 10 seconds. Now we need to talk about closed loop idle control. The first thing I want to talk about is the target idle speed because that's fairly easy to understand. Just like the base idle effort against temperature, we have a target idle speed against temperature as well. Under conditions of air conditioner function and electrical loads, we also have these additional RPM that get added to the target idle speed to arrive at the final target idle speed. At any time you can check what the current target is in the F11 window here. Next we need to consider when the ECU actually goes into closed loop idle mode. Now this can actually be conceptually a bit tricky and that a lot of people get confused by this so I'll explain it here. The main challenge is that the ECU can't actually measure idle RPM. All the ECU can do is measure the actual RPM at the moment and then it has to work out whether or not the engine's idling. Sometimes people ask me, can't we just do it by throttle position? But obviously that's not going to work because if you free rev the engine up to 4000 RPM, take your foot off the throttle, then you've got your foot off the throttle but the engine's not idling yet, it's still at 4000 RPM. So if the ECU went straight into closed loop idle at that point, then it'd be bringing the idle down a lot because the engine speed is way too high. And then so eventually instead of coming down to idle nicely it would actually stall. So obviously we can't do that. Another situation that we don't want the ECU to go into closed loop idle is when we're actually driving along but with our foot off the throttle. For example if you're at 2000 rpm in fifth gear with your foot off the throttle, if the ECU went into closed loop idle under this condition then it would say that the engine's idling too high even though the engine's not idling it's actually being spun by the car. So the ECU would then bring back the idle effort in an attempt to reduce the RPM which isn't going to work and then when you put your foot on the clutch when you stop the car the engine would stall. So we can't do it then either. There are two ways that the ECU can determine when to go into closed loop idle. The first is the better way and that's the way that Mazda and Nissan do it from the factory. They have one switch on the clutch pedal and another neutral switch on the gearbox. Both of these go into the ECU and the ECU knows to only go into closed loop idle either when the clutch is pressed or when the gearbox is in neutral. To wire this up one side of each switch connects to ground, then the other two wires connect into the digital inputs on the ECU. Then you select both inputs as being clutch switch. You can also connect them both in parallel to one input and then select that as clutch switch if you want. The other way, which isn't as good, is the way that Toyota, Mitsubishi, Honda do it. And that is to only go into closed loop idle when the car's stationary. 
So this means that if you're driving along with your foot on the clutch, the ECU won't go into closed loop idle mode. To use this mode, you have to wire up a vehicle speed input into MVSS1. You need to enable that in the road speed functions and then calibrate it. Then you need to enable the option in the closed loop conditions called go into closed loop when vehicle stationary. Because the ECU won't go into closed loop if the car's moving but with your foot on the clutch and the engine's idling, the drivability won't be as good as on a, a Mazda or a Nissan system, but it seems to work well enough. To compensate for the fact that you can't go into closed loop idle when the car's moving, the ECU has a function where you can add additional idle effort when the car's moving and the ECU is in open loop. Generally try to have this number as small as possible because the larger that you have it, the harder the car is to drive. Once you've selected those conditions, the other condition that must be met for closed loop idle is that the RPM must be less than the target plus the control band RPM. If the RPM stays above this value for up to this neutral timeout period, then the ECU will go into closed loop idle anyway. So this fixes the case where the engine's idling way too high. And the reason that this condition has to be met is that Again, even if you are in neutral, if you do a free rev and you take your foot off the throttle at say 4000 RPM, you don't want the ECU to go straight into closed loop idle immediately. You want to wait until it comes back down to idle before it starts to control the idle speed. In addition to all this, um, the ECU will only go into closed loop idle mode when the throttle's closed. So you can check that the throttle close condition is working correctly in the F11 window. Just check the closed throttle flag and you can also check whether or not it's going to closed loop idle again using the idle flag in the F11 window. Having set all those parameters you can start to experiment with the PID gains. Stepper motors are the easiest to set up. Normally they only need integral gain so leave PD at zero and set a value in the eye somewhere between say 40 and 80. High numbers make the idle control more responsive at the expense of stability. For PWM type valves they tend to be more responsive um, and you need P, I and D to get them to work well. The actual numbers vary from one valve to the next but say P, I and D being 5, 10 and 1 for Mazda B series engines works fairly well. The last setting that I'm going to cover here is the ignition ramp rate. Now this setting allows the ECU to adjust the ignition timing at idle to stabilize the idle RPM. If you set this value to a value other than zero then the ECU can modify the ignition timing by either 10 degrees more advanced or more retarded at low RPM to try and correct the idle speed. This helps stabilize the um, loop response of the idle valve and helps make faster corrections. In this example here, which is again on a Mazda, we're using a value of 30. If on a larger engine you can normally use a higher value because of the inertia of the engine. The problem with the value being too high is the engine will hunt back and forward very quickly. Thanks very much, I'll do another video soon on how to diagnose idle control problems.